A Complexity Theory Perspective, Why Things Are Rarely What They Seem, by Ted G. Lewis. Probability theory and risk analysis assume that the world exists in a uniform, smoothly transitioning state of gradual change. However, we intuitively know that complex systems such as critical infrastructure are rarely uniform, smoothly transitioning, or consistently slow to change. In fact, the real world is quite different. Remember the massive power blackout that struck the U.S. in 2003, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in Japan, and the massive flooding in Europe a few years ago? These events are all testimony to the fact that infrastructure systems are neither smooth running nor subject to gradual change. Rather, they are episodic, or what Perbach called punctuated. Here you can see a summary of how complexity theory relates to infrastructure systems. Let's briefly look at each major characteristic. Complex systems obey power laws. Catastrophe follows levee walks in space, time, and size. Many infrastructure systems also obey power laws when they fail. If not a strict power law, most disasters occur according to a long-tailed distribution as opposed to a normal distribution. Self-organized criticality, SOC, is a distinguishing property of complex systems. This is also a feature of most infrastructure systems that fail more often and significantly than expected. Similarly, infrastructure collapse and complex systems are nonlinear. That is, they contain tipping points. If an infrastructure system reaches its tipping point, its imminent collapse will be big and surprising. There are other properties that help distinguish between complex systems and infrastructure. Competitive exclusion, or Gauss's law, says that in any ecosystem, only one species can rise and dominate the ecosystem. Infrastructure systems such as water, power, and communications tend to become monopolies as predicted by competitive exclusion. Similarly, some infrastructure systems suffer from the tragedy of the commons, which reduces resilience and makes a system weak. Tragedy of the commons can be found in many infrastructures, such as the electronic power grid, water and power systems, and transportation networks. Finally, the paradox of enrichment states that too much of a good thing can destroy a complex system. That is, sometimes enriching a complex system can destabilize it and lead to its ruin. Financial systems are prone to this kind of complexity, as illustrated by the 2008 financial meltdown. Let's take a closer look at complexity and infrastructure. There are a few definitions that might come in handy when discussing complexity theory. First and foremost, you should know that randomness is not the same as chaos, and that chaos is not the same as complexity. These are different ingredients that may or may not be found in critical infrastructure systems. Chaos theory deals with the study of tipping points. Have you ever heard of the idea that a butterfly flapping its wings in the Pacific region could cause a hurricane in the Atlantic region? Of course, the story is absurd, but it provides a good visual for the basic concept behind a more complex idea that small changes can lead to big consequences. This phenomenon is caused by nonlinearities and tipping points in nonlinear systems, and not necessarily by randomness. Because chaos theory deals largely with tipping points, it is oftentimes referred to as the butterfly effect. A random system is non-deterministic, meaning that its behavior is described by a probability distribution rather than a deterministic equation. The term deterministic means that we can predict the future from present conditions, and each time the present conditions occur, the future conditions will always be the same. Deterministic systems are predictable but they may contain nonlinearities that can cast them into chaos. In this way, a deterministic system can be stable or chaotic, depending on the circumstances. Random systems are called stochastic because their behavior is governed by probability distributions. Starting from present conditions is no guarantee that the future condition will be reached. Deterministic chaos is not the same as stochastic or random system. Many deterministic systems are confused for random systems because of nonlinear chaos. If this all seems too confusing now, at this point just remember that stochastic means random, and random does not mean chaotic. So, what is a complex system? 
First, a system is a network of components that interact somehow. As a byproduct of these interactions, emergent behavior occurs. Emergence is not easily explained by local behavior of the components, which makes it difficult to predict the emergence of the system. Complex systems evolve over time and adapt to external conditions. This process of adaptation is what makes emergence happen. But more on this confusing idea later. One of the granddaddies of complexity theory was chaos theory, simply because chaos theory was studied first. The roots of chaos theory go way back to Poincaré in the 1800s, but the modern father of chaos theory was Edward Lorenz, an American mathematician and meteorologist who observed the butterfly effect in 1960. His idea was simple, but elegant. What happens in a nonlinear system, such as the weather or other complex systems, is that the system either blows up and falls apart, or it seeks out a stable fixed point called a strange attractor. The attractor is also called a fixed point because once there, the system becomes stuck and stays there forever, or until circumstances change. Sometimes the fixed point is zero, which means the system dies. Sometimes the fixed point is infinity, which means the system blows itself apart and still dies. But most of the time, one or more fixed points exist between zero and infinity. The system is attracted to this point and stays there, hence the name fixed point. Sometimes there is no fixed point. Instead, the system oscillates in a closed limit cycle. This is okay as long as the cycle repeats and does not head for zero or infinity. So, Lorenz discovered something fundamental about complex systems subject to chaotic behavior. Complexity involves stability, or the lack of stability. A complex system is stable when it settles on a valid fixed point. It is metastable when it repeats within a closed limit cycle, and it becomes chaotic and headed for extinction when its fixed point is zero or infinity. Thus, we have three types of complex systems, stable, metastable, and unstable. Here is one way to put all of this information into perspective. Think of the universe of complex systems being made up of deterministic and nonlinear systems that are sensitive to their inputs, and another set of systems that are stochastic and emergent. The emergent systems evolve, and the deterministic systems jump around. Nonlinear deterministic systems are often subject to the tragedy of commons, or paradox of enrichment while emergent stochastic systems are often subject to self-organized criticality and rare but devastating black swan events. It seems as though you can't win. Either a system is overcome by nonlinearities, or it is capitalized by self-organization. This is a simplification of the nature of systems, but to put things in perspective, complex systems are sometimes stochastic, sometimes nonlinear, and sometimes both at the same time. For example, the electrical power grid and the economy are both nonlinear, emergent, and stochastic systems. This is why they are considered complex. So what does all of this have to do with critical infrastructure? Once again, we'll risk oversimplification, but this should be helpful. Tragedy of Commons, TOC, is a property of a system that determines its sustainability. Without the tragedy component, systems subject to the properties of a commons, such as the interstate highway system or broad economy, are sustainable. But introduce a nonlinear component, and the commons may become a tragedy. Thus, TOC is an important property of any infrastructure system, because it can cause the infrastructure system to eventually fail. For example, what happens to the interstate highway system if it outgrows the taxes needed to repair it? Other examples of infrastructure systems that may be subject to the tragedy of commons are listed here. The electric power grid may fail if regulatory policy reduces incentives for power utilities to build and maintain adequate transmission capacity. Similarly, the wireline communications infrastructure could cause the cellular telephone network to fail if carriers are not incentivized to build and maintain enough wireline transmission capacity. Highways, bridges, and drinking water systems wear out and begin to fail if not properly maintained. Who pays for such mundane repair work? The nuclear power industry in the U.S. is propped up by regulation that makes everyone in the business responsible for a nuclear power plant catastrophe. 
such as the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Does this shared responsibility adequately protect the industry, or does it prevent adequate investment in safety and security? Finally, consider the enrichment policies of ethanol for fuel. This proposed exchange may help reduce dependence on oil, but will it ruin the meat industry? These are all complex systems that may be subject to the tragedy of commons. What about self-organized criticality? We know that SOC magnifies consequences and builds up to a critical point. When something simple happens, the house of cards comes tumbling down, so to speak. Examples of this are the emergence of ice from water, the explosive spread of diseases that transition from an epidemic to a pandemic, the ups and downs of the stock market that end in a dramatic crash, the development of civil disobedience that blows up in the form of a rebellion, the unexpected consequences of simple accidents that build up to become major disasters like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, or Fukushima Daiichi. In general, self-organized criticality explains black swans such as massive power blackouts, communications failures, oil spills, and financial meltdowns. Is SOC the cause or the result of chaos? This is left as an exercise for you. Many disasters obey the long-tailed power law. In fact, we can classify such disasters into two groups, low-risk and high-risk. Low-risk systems such as the stock market, large fires in cities, tornadoes, and terrorism have shorter exceedance probability tails than high-risk disasters like hurricanes and forest fires. High risk implies less resilience because the slope of the exceedance probability curve on a log-log plot is less than 1. This means that risk steadily increases with bigger and bigger consequences. On the other hand, if the slope is greater than 1, risk decreases with high consequence. We should think about different strategies for high and low risk disasters. It seems odd that disasters obey a power law when they should obey bell-shaped normal distributions. Why a power law? The answer lies deep in complexity theory. A couple of explanations are 1. Disasters obey extreme statistics, such as the distribution of maximum or minimum values instead of average values. 2. Normal accidents are caused by a chain of coupled incidents that are conditional. The conditional probability of an event is different than the independent probability of an event. Typical conditional probabilities are the product of many independent probabilities. The product of probabilities forms a long tail distribution that is close to a power law. An even deeper explanation is that catastrophes are really the result of fractured fractals, self-similar systems that become damaged, leaving gaps or holes in the fractal. If we take this more unusual approach, then the fractal dimension of the system is equal to its resilience. Therefore, higher dimensional fractals are more resilient than lower dimensional fractals. Thus, lower dimensional systems are more fragile than higher dimensional systems. In any case, fractured fractals break according to a long tail distribution, typically a power law. In summary, Critical infrastructure and key resources, CIKR, are often complex systems with fragility that varies according to the type of complex system, deterministic or stochastic, linear, nonlinear, or emergent. These systems are shaped by a number of forces. Some of them are obvious, and some are not so obvious. For example, there may be engineering reasons for fragility, or in some cases, infrastructure systems may be weakened by the very regulations that were once enacted to protect them. This means that critical infrastructure and key resource systems cannot really be understood as simple systems. A power grid possesses more energy than the sum of all of the transformers, power plants, and transmission lines contained within it. You must also consider the way it is wired together. A power grid is complex because of its structure. We need to develop policies that recognize the complexity of CIKR. This requires an approach that bears consideration for the topics we discussed, as well as related topics such as cost, NIMBY, not my backyard, efficiency, optimizations, and regulation, things that weaken infrastructures instead of strengthening them. This is not an easy task. 
there are many policy implications that go along with these concepts. We will briefly discuss a few of them. The linear strategies are simple and quite straightforward. First, we'll address the risk-informed decision-making strategy described in previous lectures. We could also consider just consequence or resilience instead of risk, or perhaps divide the assessment into pieces, protection, prevention, and response. Like I said, this is a simple approach and has many drawbacks. A nonlinear strategy is more involved and perhaps more difficult to implement because it requires a deeper understanding of complex systems theory. A SOC informed decision making strategy attempts to reduce SOC in infrastructure systems. There are a variety of ways to do this, but they all require adding non optimal and non efficient capabilities such as redundancy and surge capacity. Then there is the controlled or directed emergence approach. Can we guide the evolution of an infrastructure system so as to avoid the buildup of SOC? For example, policies that reduce concentration and choke points also reduce SOC. Is the question really about protection, prevention, and response, or is it about sustainability and resilience? We think long-term sustainability is more important, but you may need to decide for yourself.